Welcome to another episode of Fight the Burnout. Uh, today we have a uh, retired uh, lieutenant from the Bend uh, Police Department, uh, Chris Carney. Uh, he is going to tell us a, a bit about his journey. It's a very interesting one and it's the first time that he's kind of talked about it, which is going to be cool. Um, we've talked a few times in the past, so thanks for being here, Chris. Uh, again, as I always say at the start of these and definitely at the end of these is take one thing from this. Just take one little nugget, learn from it, implement it into your life. Messy action is better than no action. Uh, and we're all here to develop ourselves. Nobody's wrong. Nobody's right. Nobody is bad or evil or good or bad. It's just you're where you are and we're all here to grow. You know, my motto is three different things. Have a good state, know your purpose and why in life uh, within yourself, not somebody else's and also continual growth. So we're here to give you some continual growth and learning from people's experiences uh, in law enforcement and first responding. Uh, and other areas of life, other people's careers. But um, yeah, Chris, as I always like to do, I like to let you introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your policing career, where you worked, um, and then we'll kind of go into, you know, the story of Chris Carney. Okay. Oh, well, it's an interesting <laughs> journey for sure. Um, well, I started as a reserve in 88. If I remember right from one of your prior podcasts, you were one. Yep, and, I was one. I was born in 87. So, yep. <laughs> well, at least when I started full time in January of 89, you were about two. So, yeah. at least I uh, progressed. Um, so, I started out kind of um, the way a lot of people would as a reserve with the Shoots County Sheriff's Office. And so, I'm one of the anomalies where I know you've talked about your prior podcast. I was not wanting to drive cars fast, I was wanting, not wanting to chase people. That really wasn't my thrill. I wanted a secure job that gave me a great retirement. And I knew um, in high school, I knew a guy whose dad was a state police off the, um, trooper here, they call him, who was retired. And he was doing pretty well retired. So and I thought, that's what I want. I want stability. I want to have that in my future. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I started as a reserve. They said, hey, the best way to get hired or get paid time, because I was working a sawmill at the point here in Bend was to do the reserve and work in the jail. So I started doing a ton of time in the jail, um, ended up getting uh, engaged to get married. And right before the wedding, I got called in and asked if I wanted a full-time job and I jumped at it. Um, so I did three years in corrections. Um, so I went through two academies. Um, the first one I went through all the accolades class president, uh, physical fitness award. Uh, here they call it the Governor Vicatia Award, which is like the overall you're a stud type of person. Yeah. So I'm obviously <laughs> feeling pretty good about myself, right? Pop of everything, yep. <laughs> uh, but going into my second year, we can get into a little bit more. Worked with some people, real negative environment. I'm almost left. If I could have found a different job, I would have left. Uh -huh. But by this time, I'm married. I have a um, two really small babies and what are you going to do? Third year, everything went great. Um, got with a really good team. I'm back, you know, feeling good. And we worked a lot with Ben police officers cause they brought the most people in to the jail. Um, never heard anything bad about their chief. Everybody loved working at the department. Um, chief Malcolm was looked at as like a God, um, Everybody said, you know, he picks his troops off the tree. He's got like an, a tree that he just picks the best fruit off of. Yeah. So somebody suggested I apply with him. And I said, well, I had at one point, but I got the Dear John, you don't have a degree letter. And they said, well, they said we can get people past that if we think they'll be really good. So hence, I got past that um, degree part, which um, luckily through my now 22 years of band, I was able to get an associate's degree and then a bachelor's degree. Um, but getting in was pretty tough. Got in. I went to the second academy and zip. I was third in the mile and a half run and I smoked everybody in corrections. I was okay class wise, but it was like a whole different environment. And I went there thinking, oh, here I am. You know, I'm a pretty athletic. I do triathlons, you know, um, all these multi sport events, and I'm getting my butt kicked by all these other guys and they're people from everywhere. They're coming from Utah laterals, you know, and so the competition was really stiff. So it was a good awakening for me from that, um, 
I don't want to say necessarily arrogant, at least internally, maybe there's some arrogance of, wow, look how well I did. Mm. Um, in a business, I have no, really no knowledge of besides talking with a friend's dad. Um, so I started out like everybody on patrol. And so in, I was in 89, 92, I went to Ben Police Department. Yeah. Um, within, I think it was three years, I ended up on, they created a traffic team and I was on there with Corey Darling, who you um, have had on your past podcast, yeah. um, now chief. So we worked motors together huh. um, and just had a blast. But we probably burned ourselves out because all we, I mean, we went hard. We just nailed it, went boom, boom, boom. Um, I, because of my young family and they were most important to me, I didn't try to go to detectives, took a lot of time away from home. The commitments were pretty big. Yeah. And I also had a little bit of lack of confidence. So probably my first 14 years or so, I did things that were easy. Traffic was really easy. I could be a hard charger. Um, supervisors loved it, right? Because, hey, you're, this guy's going out and he's getting them. Did a lot of DUI arrests, was really became proficient and good at DUIs. So I uh, became a DUI sobriety test instructor, um, radar instructor, stuff like that. Really a focus towards traffic, probably because I lacked a lot of confidence in my ability to do in-depth interviews. Um, and not everybody's really willing to help necessarily. They don't say, oh, you, you'll do great. And I'd try to watch people if I got a chance, but um, I didn't get a lot of them. And then I went through a divorce in 2002. And I finally got an opportunity to try to go for detectives. Yeah. Um, well, I think it was probably my third promotional I tried for. And they pretty much said, you got to have detectives. You score really high, except they, when it comes, you don't have detectives and it just, it drops me. Hmm. So I was like fourth or fifth on a list of sergeants. Um, I was finally in a place where I could say, okay, I can go do it because financially um, I've got myself out of all the debt I was in. Um, and I went into detectives and I had such a blast. I just decided I'm going to do everything I can to, um, learn everything I can, whether I promote or I don't, promote, I don't care mm. because it doesn't hurt me to become knowledgeable. Yeah. Um, so I really started pushing and I had, um, some really great success in some of the cases for some reason I know get pushed on a lot of the sex abuse cases, but they really went, um, successful. Um, I can't think of any cases that I would have um, that went to court that I hate to say I lost. Yeah. Uh, because to me, the DA's job is to try the case. My job is just to present the evidence as I which, had it. Which is very, a very, uh, just, I just want to touch on that real quick because I see it all the time. It's a very, very important thing to remember. It's not your job to get the, get the conviction. It's your job to present everything so that the, um, the lawyers or the DA or the prosecutor can present everything. If it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work out. But and the sentencing, but that's not on you. That you know, your job is to give everything and do the best that you can for your role, and then <laughs> carry on. Yeah, personal. Now, you may if you do a really piss poor investigation. Now, you need to get some training to, to exactly, that. exactly. But to me, one of the best compliments I ever got was that I came across extremely good to the juries because I was just honest. They'd yeah. ask me a question. If I didn't know, I didn't try to go, uh, well, you know, this or, you know, I, no, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember so a sure. case where did you, I got it two months after it happened. It's an underage thing. Did you check the garbage for a condom? No, <laughs> I, I want to say, well, no, why would I, I didn't even go to the house. And, and it looked kind of, maybe it looked bad or it didn't because it was two months ago. Would they still have the garbage there? Regardless, I just, I was honest. No, I didn't. Yeah, exactly. You know, That's all you can well, do. Maybe, I, I mean, maybe <laughs> I, you know, but the jury, you know, you always make that contact with the jury. Yeah. And, that rapport. And of course, DUI almost always went to trial. Um, mm. Well, a good percentage anyway, because, you know, it's your word kind of against theirs. We didn't have video necessarily, but I just built such a rapport in testifying. And I, that was to me, that was my stage. Yeah, I got to look at the jury and I got to tell them what I knew. Yeah, and let them decide if we lost a case. I didn't go out of there mad, and I think that can lead to burnout. Um, yeah, 
the trial stuff didn't. Um, so anyway, after a year in detectives, um, an op, a spot came open. So they promoted me to sergeant. Mm -hmm. um, so as a sergeant, I oversaw traffic again. As part of that traffic detail, I oversaw community service officers. Um, and I oversaw the school resource officers. And um, I always thought one of the goals thing was as a supervisor for the community service officers, they're kind of, besides taking our minor reports, they also did like our dog enforcement and things like that. I'd actually go out and write animal control tickets with them. Um, because what do you, lead by example, if you're gonna ask yeah. them to do it, which sucked. I <laughs> and I didn't do a ton of it, but the morale boost for, for people. Yeah. Lead by example. I love that. I love that. You know, it is. It's so much lead by example. Do you know, if you can't ask somebody else to do something you're not willing to do yourself. Um, also, some things we can get into a little bit later. I had my little bumps along the way as, as a supervisor because I wasn't as good at being the disagree, shut up and just push the, uh, you know, the agenda. So I wouldn't go out and just go, the man, administration is stupid. Um, yeah. But I also wouldn't go and go, hey, this is the best way to go. This is the, we're right on. I would try to say, well, people in charge are making the decisions. That's their job. So that's, that's the smartest. I, that's the, that is actually the smartest way because then you don't get too overly involved in it in a positive or a negative way. It's just what it is. Because at the end of the day, that's what it is. Um, all right. So you, so you got into sergeants. Yeah. Ooh. And I did. Um, so patrol sergeant as well, um, ended up getting promoted. And I wish I could remember the dates on these. I, I really can't. I know I was for either 14 years in my career or 14 years at Ben before I got promoted. Yeah. Um, I then went up to lieutenant. Um, so as lieutenant, um, I became lieutenant with another um, lieutenant. We were kind of new on patrol. Corey was the captain. Um, Corey Darling, who you, you're yeah. uh, chief Sun River now phenomenal experience i mean it was like you're just on a high because morale had been low we got in there and we just started really trying to make things better being more involved leaving the doors open because i knew what it was like when the doors were closed uh oh what's going on yeah. and every, somebody's in trouble yeah. um, really if the, door, if the door got closed behind you when you went into the office you wanted to take the lube in for that boot <laughs> yeah. I, I have to say i did one time shut the door intentionally because I wanted people to think somebody was getting their butt chewed, which they really weren't, yeah. but they had done something off duty that really had made yeah. people doubt them. So yeah, anyway, it, yeah. Have it, it, it gets, it gets, it gets, a, it gets, a, it gets a point across, but yeah, now I remember my, I had a Sergeant once just to, just for shits and giggles. We decided to do that. I was like, should I close the door? And he's like, you're not in trouble at all. I was like, let's just wind them all up and just see what happens. <laughs> and so he, we closed the door and he like made a whole big ruckus. And then we had our conversation and then made a whole big ruckus. And then I go open the door and everybody's like, what happened? I was like, nothing. nothing. I was like, oh, and just played along with it. <laughs> just to, just to joke around. But yeah, it is it, when that door closed, when that door's closed, it's, it's so true. Um, you know, people start to yeah. kind of ask questions and they all look at you and you know, yeah. Um, okay. So your Lieutenant started building the morale with another guy and with Corey, um and yeah, then what happened I, well i put in for a captain's position i didn't get it um out of three of us that applied the one guy who got it was probably the one that i won't say everybody but most people would not have chosen whether it was yeah. me or the other um out of the three but um and then the chief came down who was a new newer chief um at that time from the outside which was really rare for ben to have anybody from the outside come Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, he was the first one since probably Malkin when he came and he probably came in the either somewhere in the seventies or real early eighties. But, um, and then he said, well, we'd like you to go work for the new captain in, um, services part, which was a little bit tough, but okay, I'll do it. That scene is like that step of trying to get to that next level or whatever. Um, so I became the PIO for the department. Um, I don't remember if I really oversaw anybody. I still did a lot of traffic. I did a ton of media stuff. Did a lot of media stuff. Um, so what I haven't talked about, which we can go into um, here pretty quick, is how this all evolves into me getting called on, of all days, Halloween, 
into by two captains. So we have three captains, um, Corey Darling, who's no longer my captain. Um, the two other captains who we, Deb and I don't get along very well. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little too vocal. I, if I don't think they're doing something right, I, Hey, I tell them, I don't think they're doing it right. Well, cops don't like that so much normally. <laughs> no, I'll tell you, uh, when karma kicks your ass, it kicked my ass on this day because they called me in and said, we're going to do an investigation. We're going to put you on administrative leave. Um, somebody has said you, you're having involvement with some women. Well, can you give me names? Uh, I don't think we can do that. Oh, now, of course, this happens at 4.55, right? I'm working an 8 to 5 job. Yeah. So, you know, when you're getting called into a room, they're shutting doors. So I offer my, do you want my gun? You want my badge? I, I mean, I've never been on administrative leave before. Yeah. And um, no, 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 no. We don't want it to look like anything. We, we want you to take your car home, do everything. So, of course, I'm spinning now. My mind is, is started going. I'm trying to put on my facade of I got control. Yeah. My brain is just starting to spin out of control. Yeah. So I go on to my office. I know things are going to be bad because I, I know my past. Yeah. Um, I know that I'm in a marriage that's not going well. My second marriage, I have now four kids. I have two smaller children. I have two adult children. And I'm involved with somebody at work. And I know this is going to go really, really bad. So one of the first things I do is I sit at my desk. I'm trying to close everything down. because so I got all this stuff I need to do. We're hiring a um, crisis intervention um, team person on a grant that I helped with. And pretty much I'm going, well, I can't. We got this going on and we got this going on. I'm supposed yeah. to go do a Twitter thing on a ride along Twitter thing with the media and all this. Oh, nope. Can't basically you're you're done. So when I went into my desk, I opened up a desk drawer, took off my gun. I put it in there purposely because I knew I didn't want that at home. Yes. Yeah. I knew this wasn't going to go well. So I shut my door. I lock it. Um, I go to go downstairs to my locker to get it. I've already been locked out of the building. They've taken my access away. I have to have somebody has to let me into the locker room. Wow. That quick. So now wow. not only am I spinning now and trying to breathe, I am spinning 2 million times faster because this is now really serious. Yeah. Um, so I go home, I get the weekend that, gosh, I think I can't remember if it's a weekday or not. Anyway, that I know the next, either the next day or the next, at least work day, I get a text from one of the guys I know who's on traffic, who says, Hey, I don't know what's going on, but I hope you're okay. And I went so much for nobody knowing. Mm. So now I'm really going to spin out of control because, um, when I, when I say, I think I'm done, it doesn't, I didn't think I was going to lose my job, but I thought my reputation and I really pushed so hard to be a really good leader and, um, bring the department, and the people along in a way that they really enjoyed working again and became really great cops and, you know, thrived in their daily jobs and at home. And here I am the leader that's now going to be embarrassed. Mm. I'm that guy. Mm. And so I thought I'm not, I can't stay here. What am I going to do? I mean, I'm, I'm done as far as my reputation because nobody's going to look at me. I know what cops are like. I'm going to be the pss, 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 yep. everywhere. Um, well, the investigation ends up taking, I think it was pretty close to Christmas when I finally said, what is going on? Because wow. oh, I have a bunch long. of different interviews and, um, part of the problem is, is I'm not sleeping. Um, I've separated, I've separated from my, um, second wife. We're separated. Um, I have my son is who's five or six at the time. He's living with me. I, I move in with my one of my older daughters and her husband, and they're renting a house that we had we owned. So I'm in with them, but I'm just laying there and I'm thinking, what a, what an example am I to my son? Mm. You know, here I am, all this stuff going on, and I have this young man I'm raising. Who what what's how is he going to look at me? Um, my younger daughter was uh, staying mainly with my mom, and once I moved in with my mom, then I had the kids. Yeah. 
me, uh, but I was sleeping about an hour a night and not an hour solid. I'd fall asleep wow. for a little bit and wake up. Lost 20, I lost 10 pounds the first week. I lost a total of between 20 and 25 pounds before it was over, which is, uh, I don't recommend it for great weight loss then. But, <laughs> no, that's not uh, great. <laughs> and you just, I mean, the, the stress of not knowing what's going on. And my biggest problem that happened was they would ask me during the investigation, tell us what happened. Well, I could tell them, but they're kind of asking me this open slate. Yeah. And um, I knew there were, um, they wanted to know what had happened between, as a supervisor. They didn't care about anything before supervision uh, position, but they knew about some other things or they've been told. Yeah. Um, so I know one of the, the gals um, I had been involved with, she had always talked about, I'm, you know, I'm just gonna lie. I told you can't. Well, one of the things I did, which probably shouldn't have done was I did contact her and said, Hey, I've been put on leave. You can't lie. Yeah. And um, I'm still having contact with um, the gal who I'm involved with here because we have a relationship. Um, my plan is to move forward and for us yeah. to be a couple. Um, that probably really didn't help either because they're saying we don't want you involved. She works there as well. Um, so she worked at the PlayStation? Yeah, the she's, a, she's an administrative assistant. Yeah. And I think I kind of said, here's what's going on. Um, yes, I was involved with this one person at one point. Uh, I'm involved with, um, she says I can say her name, so I have to be okay. So I'm involved <laughs> with this. Yeah. And, but we're, we're going to be together. And this is basically this is the way it is. Yeah. Part of me thinks that that probably didn't go over really well, but you know, I, I wouldn't be the one who can actually judge that. Yeah. Um, but you know, things went and then they called, they interviewed them and, um, then they come back and ask a couple more questions. Oh, okay. Yeah. I can remember this or, but I am, I, again, I can't think straight. I'm yeah. not sleeping. I'm losing weight. I'm all this stuff that had happened over the years. And there are a lot of affairs over the years. This is my, this is my, as I've talked to you about, this is my drug. Yeah. Uh, and I'm getting high when things are bad and I need my fix. It is having um, intimate relationships of some sort or sexual contact with, um, with people. And um, I want I want to just touch on that just for just for a second, just to you know bring some clarity for people uh, as well, you know. And we're going to talk about this because I'm going to ask this as well. And I just want to give you a bit of a break because I know it, this can be quite, um, you know, you're going back and you're you're going through all this. And I know and I appreciate this is one of the first times that you've openly talked about all this. Uh, so for those that are listening, I want to really you know touch on that real quick, guys. You know. Um, Chris is, you know, being vul real vulnerable here and I appreciate it, but I also want to touch on the fact of, you know, when we're in a, a struggling place, when we have things going on or when we haven't worked through, um, past things, we do different things, right, wrong, indifference doesn't matter, but I've seen this before and I've heard about people within the police force here even that do it. You know, it happens and you get one little thing of, oh, I feel so good. And you get those endorphins. doesn't matter what it is. It might be sex. It might be drugs. It might be just going off for me, riding my motorcycle stupidly and fast and seeking the thrill. And we search for that because um, we, we, we we're working through things. And once we can recognize, and I'll praise you, Chris, for this, you recognize that, hey, this is my go-to thing. This is what I do. And so I know that you've worked on it. You continually work on it now, um, and and so that it doesn't happen again. Um, but I just wanted to um, just bring some awareness to that. That this is not um, an in, you know a, a single person that this happens to. This happens to all of us. But we have to always bring awareness to it and be looking for it. That okay, this is not a thing that I'm happy with or that serves my purpose. And what do I want to do moving forward? It doesn't matter about what's happened. What do I want to do moving forward? So I just want to bring some awareness to that and also give you a moment to, 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 pro, to pause there, Chris, because I know it can be, it can be difficult talking about this stuff. Um, 
But yeah, so I just wanted to touch on that for listeners and that as well is remembering that, you know, moving forward, you get to make choices. The past has happened. Moving forward, we get to decide what we do. So Chris, you know, I want, I just, I wanted to ask one question real quick. The women that you were, you know, having affairs with or seeing and that, uh, was it at the same time or was it just over time, just different, different women throughout the years? Well, it, a little tiny bit of both. Yeah. So um, I should go into, and, and I should preface this for the viewers who wanted to understand. I'm, I'm telling this story through hindsight and a lot of therapy. Yeah. Um, Which is- professional therapy, self-therapy, um, reading books, searching online, um, all that. Because the first time a sex addict got mentioned, I went, what the hell are... I'm not a sex addict. I said no a lot. (laughs) It was offered multiple times. And I was like, no, no, multiple times. It wasn't until I started doing the research. It wasn't until I started getting into the therapy that I actually understood where, um, what was going on and where I, where I was at that point. Um, and so over the years, um, I might have, you know, an affair. And then it, I might go in a year. I might go a couple months, might go just depended on the flow of things. Yeah. Um, so what kind of happened is with my first marriage is the relationship just wasn't very mutual as far as uh, the intimacy. I think um, the disagreement that's telling for me that my first wife and I had is I told her commitment's not enough. You need love. And she said she knew that's when it was over because she thought commitment was really what was more important. Mm. And I knew my grandparents lived and slept in separate rooms. They hardly talked to one another and they didn't even seem to like each other. I mean, maybe they did, but it's a (laughs) grandkid in the house. It sure didn't look like it. I didn't want to live that way. Um, And unfortunately I wasn't strong enough as a person to go up and say, this marriage isn't working. Um, I'm sorry, I come from divorced parents. Yeah. I don't want to be divorced. I don't, you know, I'm a kid. I was a um, kid who lived with, you know, my mom and then a stepdad, hardly saw my dad. And I just didn't want to do that because I, you know, good or bad. What I learned from my dad is I can't be absent and I didn't want to be away from my kids. I read to my kids every night. I wanted to be there. Yeah. Um, Problem is now great in hindsight, I, what, what a better message or a better person I would have been if I could have just went up and said, hey, this isn't working. I am really sorry. I know you're going to be pissed and I know you're going to be mad and you're going to call me names, but I, I need to move on. Yeah. Um, because when I started having an affair, what that did is that filled a void in that marriage. So now the marriage wasn't so bad. Yeah. Now I could actually feel like, oh, it doesn't feel that bad. So um, I used to have a cycle I called that we'd go I'd say, I've had enough. I can't do this anymore. I need to leave. And she would ask me not to, and then say, you know, maybe I'm sorry. I I know I shouldn't say those things or treat you that that way or whatever. And then we'd have three months of just great, perfect marriage. The next three months were, well, we're kind of going back to normal. And then the next three to nine months are just, so that was kind of my cycle. And um, so there were affairs spotted here or there along that way. I think what I didn't realize is once that marriage finally ended, um, I just thought, well, that's just because that was kind of a emotionless, um, physical-less mm. relationship. What I didn't realize is when I got into my second marriage was when things went wrong. Now here's where I went for my, my help. Um, one thing people may or may not know, the brain chemicals released, you got, uh, I got a read them, unfortunately, but dopamine, you got oxytocin, uh, serotonin, and endorphins. Mm -hmm. My drug wasn't heroin, but I can only empathize completely with a heroin addict because I was to a point right before I left um, police work where I tried really hard to say, no, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And all of a sudden, I just go, screw it. I'll do it. So... Chris, what, um, you know, what need do you feel you were, you were, you were looking for when it came to 
the you know this the 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 other women this the you know that 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 side of things you know moving from your marriage and the relationship that you were to the affairs what what need were you trying to fill well i think initially it's that wanting to be wanted mm. you know um your your dad's gone your mom is busy she's working i'm i'm with i'm the youngest of three brothers mm. I'm growing up in the late seventies uh, with them isn't it? You know, my impressionable years are in the seventies and eighties. And in that time, sex is seen as look at this, look at me. I mean, they were, we were being criticized in middle school if you were a virgin. Yeah. Um, so that's how I saw being seen as, um, I don't even know the right word for it. Just being seen as you are what a person, you know, look at you. Cause that was what, Hey, my brother, my oldest brother was, I mean, he was really sexually active. Um, people just loved him. And it seemed to be, that's how you got your accolades. Yeah. The difference is I never told anybody. Mm. Um, Corey became my, um, cause I'm not represented by a union. So he kind of becomes my go-to person I can go talk to. Yeah. And um, he, I think at one point, kind of got accused of, oh, you have to know this because you guys are friends. I can't tell anybody. Yeah. I, well, you, I, never, you, never, you never do because deep down inside, and you know, I can, I can tell from our conversations that we've had in the past, even just today, and I'm sure listeners and viewers can get as well. You know, you're a very caring person. You care a lot, but there's a need that has to be filled. And as you said, from a very early age, and I want to reiterate this for listeners and viewers to really make sure that they pay attention to it is in our early years, especially our toddler, toddler years, the things that we see, the stories that we create in our heads set us up for the future, unless we go back and kind of rewire them or relook at them and see what that five, six, seven year old brain interpreted. And so when you're seeing, uh, you know, I'm going to bring up a few things here, Corey, um, is, you know, you've got parents that aren't in a great relationship. It sounded like, you know, I know you said your parents ended up getting divorced. You see your grandparents sleeping in different rooms. Uh, you see intimacy is the, you know, uh, probably subconsciously or consciously you heard things about intimacy and how important it is. I know from my past, my parents used to fight about sex all the time. So I can relate in a way sex is like one of those things that it's like, that's intimacy that, that for in my mind, the interpretation that I've always had until I've worked through it is sex is intimacy. Sex is, you know, that's where, you know, you're, you're, you're taking, you're, you know, you're cared about because of what I heard and saw and that when I was a kid. And so it's remembering this guys that those things. And, you know, for you, Chris is as you were, you know, developing, these seeds are planted into your head. And then from the, what I'm, my hallucination from what I'm hearing is that then when things weren't going well with either work or in your marriage, it was, uh, well, I'm not getting it here. How do I find it? Yeah. It, the, and that's kind of the initial way, but I think what happened towards the end was it's now it's the fix. Yeah. It's and now, and then it becomes a chemical thing where it's like, Hey, Oh, I can get this quite easily. So let's get this fixed because then I feel better. Then I'm better for my relationship. I'm better for my kids, which are really important to me. I'm better at a job. Oh my God, I feel much better. I had the same thing when I was doing uh, mine. Uh, mine became adrenaline and became riding a motorcycle fast and disconnecting. And, and, I, and I got to the stage where I almost cheated on my wife. Um, but for me, I saw the, you know, my purpose, my why in life is to create less pain. And so that is what I live by. It's my mission statement to create less pain for myself and others. So we create the best version of ourselves. And I recognize that is what I do for coaching is I help people identify to their mission statement, not to what they do. Uh, and once you, once I, you know, I recognize now the reason that I didn't end up doing going down that affair line is because I saw my parents cheated on each other and I heard about it and I, it was put into my, into my toddler brain that creates more pain than the benefit of getting it, of actually doing it. Yeah. Until you tell yourself that as long as nobody finds out, nobody gets hurt. Yeah. But right? what I felt what, from, for me, when I was a kid, the reason that I didn't end up going down that and I stopped myself before it actually happened was that I had, it, it, I knew that it gets found out because of 
my parents' relationship, my interpretation, obviously everybody's different, is different on their things. Um, but mine was, hey, I can get away with riding my motorcycle stupidly fast in the back roads of New Zealand because I know where cops sit and I know where the cops drive and I know because I have all that, so I can get away with this. Sweet, let's do this because it fills me up, makes me feel good for a short time. Yeah, and that is that is the problem. I, um, as we talked about towards the end, when I was given in to temptations, I was really trying hard to fight yeah. I would walk away. I just, I remember I literally beat my head with my hand. I yeah. was so ashamed of myself. I was so upset mm. that I allowed myself to do that. Then, um, you know, you go that short period of time where I'm not going to do this anymore. And then all of a sudden you start, um, part of my problem and part of the problem with that, uh, with the investigation was I buried so much of this. Mm -hmm. Ask anybody. I had two affairs, uh, because one's, one's bad. Two's not real good, but as many, if I'd ever admitted to what I'd actually been going through, it would have been really bad. Yeah. So I just, everything got buried. I just take it, compartmentalize and throw it in a hole where I did, I couldn't find it. And that was part of the problem when they're asking me, well, tell us about what this and that. I can tell you this happened. Um, ask me a specific question. I, I might remember, but one time during the investigation, I got asked, well, I was, um, one person said, you did this at some place. And I almost said, you fucking liar. Because I'm like, that's bullshit. That never happened. Then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, wait. Oh, shit, maybe it did. I, I don't even know. Yeah. But I just, I hung up the phone. I collapsed on the bed again because, you know, again, I'm still not sleeping. Yeah. Um, I still can't think straight. And I'm just like, this is, I'm, I'm going to lose my job. Yeah. Um, I wanted out of police work at this point. I knew I needed to get out. I mean, I had spent five years trying to financially get prepared to leave. Before um, all this happened. Yeah, I was paying down bills, paid off. Um, you know, I was, got out of my first marriage in significant debt. Took four and a half years to pay off all the credit card debts and everything else that was accumulated. Um, and then I worked to try to build stuff and get the mortgages where they needed to be. Um, actually, luckily, because you know, I took me five months to get another job. Um, I had enough years to retire. I wasn't old enough to collect. Mm. Um, so I had to, I had to go get a job. I needed insurance and all that stuff like that. I had kids to support. Um, so, you know, things had obviously spiraled way out of control. Eventually they come back and, um, I asked the chaplain, can you please find out what's going on? This is in December or something. So right before Christmas, they came back and uh, Corey brought over my direct captain's report. And it just, it demolished me. Mm. How terrible I am. What a, I, you know, what a bad, basically person I am. And I remember thinking, I've done a lot of really good stuff. Um, the media has now been notified. The city of Bend is sending me a folder says, this is what we're releasing to the media because we believe they have the right to have it. It, the, and literally, it is this thick, Chris. I am not kidding. It is an inch thick folder. Two pieces of paper in that whole thick folder is bad. One said, I called the guy a dickhead on a traffic stop. So I got a verbal. How many times, how many times did I do that? <laughs> so, I written, so I got a written reprimand. That's one sheet. Another one was 18 years prior. Um, well, it might be 19 years at this point. Um, I had had a relationship with somebody while I was uh, conveniently. So I will, I will take this for anybody who wants to criticize me for it. I was on quote lunch. It yeah. would have been a paid lunch out of public view. And we had had um, oral contact on two separate occasions. Um, and those, that was, that was it. The rest so of I, I just, I just want, I just want to clarify real quick because I'm, still trying to wrap my head around how this got spiraled so far, which I know I would, I'll, uh, we'll talk about in a second. Uh, when you say oral contact, is that kissing or further? 
oh no, that's uh, that's a blow job and okay. Uh, okay, going sorry. and one time <laughs> yeah, going down on somebody. So yeah, it's yeah okay, cool. All right, okay. so I just wanted I just wanted to clarify on that just because I was I was curious and I know people will be as well. All right, so you had that. So you had those two pieces of paper for you know that one time when being on lunch. So technically, I guess on duty, but on on lunch um depending on i'm in a paid status I, yeah paid status so yeah okay cool uh, okay well, <laughs> I, the, the reason the reason i laugh i'm not laughing at you is because i've heard of and either in the states or here of that happening so many times between officers between an officer in public and it going nowhere well i can tell you, I've been out eight years, so I can't speak for the last eight years. Um, Cause I, I actually had to move out of Bend because the media blitz was so heavy. I couldn't even, I couldn't get a job. All you have to do is YouTube yeah, or not YouTube, Google me and it comes up. So I ended up moving to Portland, which is where I was born. And I grew up as a smaller kid and got a job here. Um, but the media intensity, I think made it so bad that it helped push the city to want to get rid of me. Yeah. But I am the only person I know of up to my departure that had ever been pushed out of the department. And that's including people that were really high, higher ranked than I was who had been involved in stuff. Yeah, affairs. I mean, I mean I'm not con- I'm not condoning affairs or, you know, doing stuff on duty and that, but you hear about it all the time. You know, it's one of the reasons that you know, I know of so many people that, um, and I'm not going to name names or anything, but so many people that have ended up having affairs with other cops on their section or on their unit, maybe not a supervisor and, uh, you know, and, a, and somebody below them, but have ended up because there is that, and this is comes into the burnout, they're so burned out with what they're doing, and they're so disconnected from themselves that they end up seeking validation from somewhere else and that the needs that they're not getting at home or they feel they're not getting at home uh, are not uh, they they get served by somebody that quote unquote understands them and then it ends up it ends up happening so because otherwise we're gonna we're gonna run out of time so obviously you go on you got pushed out um got i take it told uh, uh, were you given an ultimatum either we're going to fire you or you resign <laughs> they, they it was clear to me they were going to try to fire me yeah well they would have they would have fired me i'm not so sure i couldn't have got my job back i don't if you look in context we're talking about on duty sexual contact yeah i had on duty contact with one person there were four that they were looking at yeah the other one thing was said, well, um, there was somebody from the media and they went, I said, it's nobody's business because nothing ever happened work related. I mean, not nothing at all. No. Well, you met her through work. So <laughs> we think we need to know. I know so, cops and, that have married somebody they met through work. <laughs> well, through my therapy, my therapist said, well, that makes no sense. 80% of the couples all met at work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I mix messages. I'm, I'm the, telling myself how terrible of a person I am. And here's my therapist yeah. going, well, that's normal. Yeah. So what ended up happening is um, none of the contact was maybe the longest one ever would have been 10 minutes. Um, no clothing was ever removed or anything. I could have responded to work. I, the problem of it is, is if I fight it and I win, one, it's going to cost me probably $10,000, $20,000 to fight it. Because yeah. I got to pay for my own attorney. The other is, is do I want to win? Because <laughs> no. if I win, I got to go back to the department that thinks I'm a schmuck. <laughs> so, yeah, so you got that image side of things as well. Well, and I, as my stepdad said one time, well, if you didn't lie, then you should take, then you should fight it. Okay, but guess what? Even if I, um, I win, and I'm sure I will, because three, three of these people were never in a paid status. Yeah. Um, one was. And that one person that paid status is enough, I believe, to fire me. So why do I want to risk it? I don't even want to be in this profession anymore. I'm falling apart. I'm not healthy. Mm. Um, mentally, I'm in a terrible place. Um, I just don't want to do that. So um, that's where 
they let me stay one day past my 25 years, which was like two or two more weeks than when they decided when I got the letter that says, we think you suck. We're going to, we're, I'm recommending you be fired. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I, you know, here I, I have to, I don't have to, I hire an attorney because I'm thinking I need some protection. Yeah. Um, I don't, and then you're going, I'm not gonna have any money. <laughs> you know, how, how am I in all these concerns and you're still not, I might be sleeping up to three hours at this point, but that's not all at once. So I'm still pretty brain dead. Yeah. Um, Sleep does that. I really want to point out something that was huge to me uh, because there was a tiny bit of overlap with a couple. One of the persons that was at work, um, I had tried, I, you know, the reason I was able to have affairs with people is because they were suffering like I was, right? Yeah. They're not getting a need fulfilled. And this one person had always kind of offered, hey, you want to? And I, for like nine months, was like, no, no, you know, I, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person. While I'm having a extremely emotional affair with Crystal before it becomes physical, we, we get each other, we're working together. We just, I mean, amazing relationship. Um, I'll say I was right because um, as I, nine years we've, we have been together and it's, it's better than ever. We're still in the honeymoon phase where how good that relationship feels. So at least I got something right. But so I had at one point, she had, I was there off duty, but I was at work and she had said something about, um, you know, propositioning. And I was like, no, no. And then I just, again, uh, you, I'm fighting, I'm fighting. I, I give in. Oh, fine. Just boom. Um, and so one of the things that Corey had told me, I was over at his house, I'm talking to him and I, I'm saying, you know, I don't, I'm trying to remember, but they're just, I mean, I'm having a hard time. And he just goes, you know, if you love Crystal, like you say you do, and yet you're still doing this, then something's wrong. Mm. And I went, wow. I don't know why it took that for the light bulb to go off in my head that he's right. I mean, I'd already checked into getting seen a counselor. So I was mm. on the initial parts of that through work, but it hadn't, nothing had really developed completely there. So I'm, I'm not really fully into uh, counseling and, and therapy of any sort. Um, but that statement alone, um, and then I started reading a book called Out of the Shadows, which mm. is about sex addiction. Um, and I started going, oh, wow, really? Well, that fits. And that fits. Oh, man, that fits. Um, another really good book, I think, for especially for cops is a um, Judy Smith wrote a book called Good Self, Bad Self. Yeah. It talks about ego, how important ego is. But too much ego is really bad. Too little ego is not good either. Yeah, it's that so balance. Started, you know, it started reading that book and went, oh, my God, here, there. Oh, shit, there. So mm. all this stuff started coming around. Um, my message for anybody is, I, it was too late for me, but it's not too late for somebody else. And um, I'm an advocate for um, people to get help and get therapy. Mm -hmm. One of the problems is I asked myself after a couple of my incidents where, should I go seek help? I can't, can't do it because there's a stigma around it. Yeah. I'm not tough. Um, only whips go to counseling. Um, you're, you worry about the promotional process. What's going to happen to my career? I'm on a pretty good career. Uh, trajectory. Yeah. I've had the chief ask me, do you, are you interested in being interim chief at other departments? If they have somebody, yeah, I have, um, I've gone to the state capital and took part in, a emerging leaders for, um, the cops will hate me, but it is for the democratic party asking, you know, we're looking for people, candidates to run for state office. And so you had a lot, you had a lot, you had a lot going, a lot going. I, and I can see why you got so, why you got so stressed out because you had so much going on. And then all of a sudden you're told you're a piece of crap. Um, so you've gone from one high kind of to the other high. Yeah. And I was getting my degree. So I was pushing myself. I was, I was spent. Mm. Um, I knew at one point that I was, I was really pushing my limit on what I could handle. Um, Cause I never turned down any work. You want to, you want a program? I'll write, I'll write a, I'll write a proposal for expanding the traffic team. It, that's not just saying, Hey, we need four guys. Cause this that's researching. 
uh, traffic a lot of work crashes it's budgets it's this it's and i didn't turn anything down. i came to work an hour early i worked through my hour lunch i'd sometimes stay later so so chris real quick because i just want to go into this before we kind of wrap up what is you know what would be uh, you know what would be the key things maybe you know one or three things that if you could have learned them because i know you've been out for a little while now but well not even that long but you know if you look back over your whole career what would be like the top three things that you would obviously everything that's happened has happened for us so you wouldn't be where you are right now you and i wouldn't be talking if it hadn't happened so it's actually a blessing in disguise um even though it sucks at the time i can relate to to that part of it um and the you know the damages that it can cause and all that but it all helps us all develop but what would you say to your younger self if you could go back in time or to say a new troop or a new officer what would be like the, those top three things that you would say to them so that they can help one maybe prevent from getting to where you ended up and also be the best cop that they can be well, you got to learn to communicate. And that was my, my really downfall was my lack of ability. I could communicate on the street. I learned how to do great communication with offenders. I couldn't communicate with my spouses. Mm. Um, it didn't, I just, I couldn't figure out how to do that um, at that time. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons why um, my relationship now is so successful. Um, my, um, my spouse knows I struggle sometimes. She knows that I have, um, I miss the high. I don't miss the repercussions of the high. Um, I can tell her I, I feel that way. I would have never in a million years been able to communicate that to anybody else in my life because the repercussions of it would have been negative. She will, she'll grab me and tell me, you know, thanks for talking to me. This is, this means a lot. You're, you're doing, you've come so far. So I'm getting, I mean, that reinforcement, yeah. um, I would go in to counseling. If you, I think counseling should be mandatory for all officers. I, I agree. Probably maybe more than once a month. The problem of it is counseling has a stigma. If you go to counseling, well, something must be bothering you. Can we trust you out here in the streets? Because are you going to perform? You know, do you have what it takes? If it were something that was normal and you just always went in, you could open up and nobody, it would just be normal. Nobody would be going, what's wrong? What's wrong with Chris? You know, he's, yeah. he's going to see the counselor. Um, communication, counseling. And the other is give yourself a break. Yeah. Be kind to yourself. Um, one of the things I see a little bit related, I, I really love the public. I didn't like the internal politics. I loved working with the public. What I see in today's world, especially I, you know, I live in Portland, so you, you know how Portland is probably even everywhere around the world, right? Because of all our yeah. uh, police things we have going on here. But it's try to remember there are very few evil, truly evil people in this world. We can name Hitler. I saw one guy in death row I believe was truly, truly evil by looking in his eyes. I didn't see anything in there. Um, we can argue about Mr. Putin in today's world, that these are truly evil people. Huh. Most people make bad decisions, but unless you walk in their shoes and you can't try to be empathetic. Hmm. You don't know what's happened in their past. We don't know why that person, you know, did what they did. We don't know why that junkie's on the street, you know, with a needle stuck in their arm. We, we haven't lived that life. We can't tell their story because it's not our story. So try not to take everything so personally. And when I see um, the thing that probably bothered me the most is when Black Lives Matter came out, I wasn't in police work anymore. I was still on social media. I've gotten off of social media since uh, 2016. But I remember somebody going, Blue Lives Matter. And I thought, oh, you don't get it. Mm. Your job is to protect those people's rights. Yeah. to protest. And when Ka Colin Kaepernick, when the San Francisco uh, police force was saying, we're boycotting San Francisco because they're supporting Colin Kaepernick because he's, you know, against police. I thought, you know what you should be doing is celebrating. I disagree with him. Mm. However, it is my job to protect his rights 
to protest how he wants, as long as it's not destruction of property, it's not illegal, to give him that voice. Because our Constitution is so important in this country. Look at me. I get to protect that, whether yeah. I agree with it or I don't. And I think that's a healthier way to take it than he's against the cops. They all hate the cops. Well, screw them. Yeah, which isn't what they said. I, I remember back then because that's when I was actually in the depth of what I call my hell. Was that 2016 yeah, was kind of that going into 2016, just around that whole time of the Black Lives Matters things, the anti-police stuff. You know, there's all that kind of different stuff going on. And I remember I got on the bandwagon of Blue Lives Matter, you know, that whole thing of, you know, oh, this, you know, it, it, but what happened was it became us against them. It became me against them which made it even worse because all I did was focus on the negatives and I didn't communicate. I didn't talk about it. I didn't open my eyes to stuff. And I'm not saying that you don't need, you know, you shouldn't have opinions and you shouldn't have that. But again, what you do does not define you. You know, it is not who you are. It is what you do. And you need to focus on it that way. Yes. You might believe, Hey, I don't believe what they're saying is right, but what I do is I protect them so that they can have that right to not like what's going on. Absolutely. You're not, you're not doing anything illegal? Cool. Sweet. I don't need to worry about you, but you got that right. <laughs> go, go to Russia and try to speak against the government. The locking it, everybody up. <laughs> it, is, it, is a, it is an honor to represent people, whether you agree with their thoughts or with the, the words they are saying. As long as they're not, it's, again, I in Portland, I love the protests. I've been stuck in them in a train and a bus. I don't like them when they go violent. I don't like it when they start destroying property. Yeah. But to speak um, and to, you know, protest, what a that's what makes our country great. Yeah. I can go tell somebody, I think you suck. I don't like the job you're doing. I think you're, you're a brute. And they should, the cops should go, well, I disagree with you. However, I'm glad I can protect your rights to be able to do that because then this is a great country we live in that you can say that to me and I don't beat you over the head and throw you in jail. Yeah. Which the way it's supposed to be. I, yeah. I, we, have to, we have to change the image on how we perceive what we're hearing to be healthy. Well, again, and this, is, this comes down into what I talk about and we'll kind of wrap up here is it comes down into what I talk about. Cops... Uh, we have a tendency to join, you know, yours was a little bit different. Uh, but a lot of us, a lot of cops, what I've realized from coaching a lot of cops and coaching a lot of people to get into the police force and helping them on that side is a lot of law enforcement officers join law enforcement because of something that they've seen or dealt with or experienced or had happen uh, in the past that they haven't actually dealt with and accepted. They haven't gotten to that stage of life where they have that acceptance. And so in turn, they're trying to counteract that past traumas. And so they're bringing them into the policing. And so it's a, I have to do this because that will solve this. Instead of this is already solved. How can I then help all these people? How can I help, you know, 90% of people when I ask them why they want to join the police, I want to help people. They don't join because they want to beat people up and they want to command a presence and they want to make them do what they want them to. And, and you know, they want to help people. And the only way to help people is actually look at all people as people and, and not you. bring your past traumas and interpretations and views and put them on all these people of you, you need to be this way or you need to be that way. Yeah. And I think if I could have, I would have been so much more successful. And I think I had a really successful career. Um, it didn't end well, but if I could have got the help hmm. more than self-help more than, you know, I analyzed myself a lot, you know, am I making this right decision, that right decision, but I couldn't control it anymore. And you can and only I, see so far when you're looking at yourself because you interpret yourself the way that you want to see yourself. That's where a coach, just like on a sports team, a coach might not be the best running back, the best quarterback, may not have ever gotten any awards, but they're good at seeing your your opportunities that you can create, your shifts and changes, and 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 how to help you get there. Um, which is which is what you know what I like you said counseling regulatory should be should be mandatory or some sort of coaching and that's why I'm so passionate about helping people in their law enforcement career whether getting in or 
or developing within it or, or getting helping them transition out of it because it's the same thing. You're going to take all your past traumas and all your past experiences with you unless you work through them and then use them to help you grow even more um, on that side of things. Yeah, and that's a really good point. Law enforcement may not be the right place. At the end of my career, it was not the right place for me. Hmm. Uh, I am extremely grateful that I had the 25 years because it's really helped me. Obviously, I have a pension. I have, you know, things like that. But if you don't take care of yourself, it's also very destructive. Um, but I can understand, you know, Lance Armstrong, they asked him one time, would you go back and dope again? He goes, yeah, I would, I'd do it, everything the same. And people are like up in arms about it. How could he say that? Because I wouldn't change one thing. Mm-hmm. If it meant I couldn't be where I am today, I am so exactly. much happier today. I'm in an amazing relationship. I, my younger kids would have never had the attention that I am able to focus on them when I'm with them. And it's not as much as I'd like, but when I'm with them, they get my full attention. Yeah, I guarantee if I were still in police work going hundred million miles an hour, um, I would have said hi to them, give them a hug. I love you. Yeah. Where's dad? Like, the, dad the, the, the key the key is here for all the listeners and viewers is it's not about just kind of going along and going hey i'll end up where i end up it's about going hey i want to i want to collapse that time i want to be i want to learn from those around me and that's why you've listened to this you know uh this is why we're here is so that you can collapse some of that time down so you're not having to go through all those struggles and all those challenges to get where you're going to get to you can get there sooner and we can get to where we are. Obviously, then we can become that bigger, that better, that more impactful uh, person, um, whether that be still in law enforcement or whether that be, hey, going, hey, no, actually, no, that's not, it's not, it's not the right thing for me. Um, multiple people that I've trained to get into the police have all, you know, they've gotten right up to that doorstep of literally walking into academy or police college and gone, no, I don't want to do this, actually. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. I got tired of seeing dead bodies. I think on a prior conversation we had, we talked about, you know, I went to a crash. There's body parts everywhere. And I went and had lunch afterwards. Yeah. There's not necessarily something right with you. If you can see body parts smell, swear to God, I could smell the liver, the uh, alcohol coming off the liver that was sitting in the middle of the road and then go eat your lunch. My first, it's my my first, my very first uh deceased body was a guy who had been dead for three weeks i went and ate rice afterwards yeah if you've ever seen a body that's been dead for three weeks you know what's going on with it <laughs> and i won't go into detail here because it can cause traumatic things for people but i went and ate rice afterwards i had a rice and beef dinner <laughs> i can only think of maybe three incidents in my whole career that anything ever bothered me and it was the little kids you know doing cpr on a six month old who doesn't make it yeah. That I I noticed that bothered me. Yeah. All the other things, the suicides, the brains all matter all over. You, you just tell yourself, "Oh, I'm great. I'm good." No, yeah. you're not. And you stuff it down. You stuff it down, and eventually it comes back up. So it's, it's not healthy. It's not healthy. Uh, and so it's the, it's having those conversations. And as you said, you know, one of your top things, communication. You know, communicating with your spouse, saying, hey, I went to some traumatic stuff. You don't have to go into detail, but hey, I went to some traumatic stuff and this is how I'm feeling. Because as cops, we try to stuff our feelings away so we can be the superhuman. Well, we're not superhuman. We're just a human with a vest on and a badge. Uh, And so, you know, it's always communicating that. Um, Chris, I want to thank you so much for opening up about, you know, what what's happened, what's been going on, your journey. It's amazing to have you here. Um, any last words before we kind of before I wrap up and we kind of close down? Um, I just hope more people, really good people, get in law enforcement. Um, I may have had a bad experience at the end of it. It's a great profession, but you got to get help along the way. You can't do it on your own. You can't shut people down. You can't shut everything out um, and be healthy. Yeah. Um, I wish I'd have realized that back then. Um, be be present in what you're doing and be happy with what you're doing. If you're a patrol officer and you're you can't get promoted, be the best patrol officer you could ever be in your life, and and don't let let the rest fall into place. Yeah. If you're meant to be promoted and it's meant to be, it'll happen. If it doesn't, just be the best cop you can be. Be empathetic, care about your other fellow officers, care about yourself, your family, and care about the people. Don't 
care about the suspects. Yep. We don't want them coming back and rotating all the time. Yes, yes, yes. Be empathetic towards the suspect and as well as the victims. You know, take care of our communities. Yeah, I totally, I'm glad you said that because it's so true. And you know, this job is, um, you know, it's policing is the best job in the world, but it's also the hardest. So we need to work on the hardest part because the best part is going to be the best part anyways. Uh, but we need to work on the hardest part so that we can make sure that the best parts stay the best part because otherwise they can peel away. So again, thank you, Chris, for being here. I uh, appreciate uh, all the vulnerability, all the openness, uh, and also just all the learnings. Um, for those that are listening, uh, remember, we help you with this. If you want to be taken through the journey to um, better your policing career, better your law enforcement career, or just better your life, um, you know, email us at team at createfromwhy.com uh, and we will organize a time to have a conversation with you, see how we can help or see where we need to direct you if we can't help ourselves. Uh, but remembering, take one thing away from this, uh, just whatever's popped into your head right now, uh, when I said that, you know, taking that one thing away, just take that and put it into action because messy action is better than no action and eventually it'll become decent action and it'll become a habit. Uh, as always, I, my motto is train hard, test easy. Uh, we train our bodies uh, quite easily. We can train our bodies hard, but our mind is what's more important. So make sure you're training that hard every single day or training it with passion every single day uh, so that when you have those little tests that come up every single day, as we know they do, uh, you, uh, they're, a little, they're that little bit easier. Um, again, thank you very much, Chris, and uh, make sure you guys like, subscribe, and um, yeah, give us a comment on what you think. Till next time, we'll talk again soon.